Welcome to Energy Business. This lecture will give you some background about the worldwide energy business and the technology behind it. And we'll have some focus on Germany because here in Germany you know there is the energy wende or energy wende, the strategic change from classic energy to renewable energy. I will skip some of these slides because they are only for background information where you can find me in the office and about the lecture time. What will be our content? We will start our discussion with the basic terms about energy. You have to understand what's the difference between energy, power, electricity and heat, for example. Then we have lectures concerning energy and mobility. You know your car needs a lot of fuel, gasoline and trucks and all the other stuff that transports people and goods. A next chapter, another special lecture is on energy industry and the future of this industry. I call it industry 4.0, but we will see that this is really one of the largest industries on the globe. Another lecture is about energy research ecosystems. Where are new technologies developing? What do we need for that? And what are the basic ways to produce energy at all? One chapter is about energy conversion. Usually the energy that we'll find in nature, independent of if it's coal or wind or solar or whatever, is not really in a suitable way to use it <clears throat> in our daily life. So we have convert energy mostly into electricity, but some other ways are also well known. For example, oil has to be refined. There are goods in, in energy, energy commodities. You know the energy price of oil and other things like coal and also who sets the price, how is it changing, what are the main drivers. Most of the energy on this globe is produced by thermal power plants. A thermal power plant isn't that complex, but we have to understand why it is not so very efficient. Usually we have something like um, 30 to 40 percent. Some of them are better, some worse. But why and how? A big issue in all our economy, but especially in, in energy economy is environmental impacts. Do you want to understand how energy production has an environmental impact and special? Why is this carbon problem here and how we could solve it? And as already mentioned, we will have a lecture about the energy transformation in Germany. It is very interesting how a big industrial country changes from classic thermal energy sources to renewable energy. And then the following lecture, of course, is about solar power, the biggest environmental power we have. And another lecture is about wind power. This will give you um, some insights how the technology is working, how strong it is and what special problems are produced using this type of power. Finally, we know that if we use solar or wind, we have to store the energy because sun and wind are not a constant energy source. And so it is. I'll, so it so energy storage is today a big issue and there are different technologies that can store energy. And a final lecture is 
not directly about energy, but about the way how we distribute energy. Transmission grids, super grids, smart grids, and other ways to transport energy from source to destination. So this slide is now motivating you why you should understand more about energy. And so I have here a chart that is from the FAZ, that's in Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung in Germany, that's a well-known top press product. They have a very good um, business part and they listed the biggest companies in the world. And so we see the 20 biggest companies and if we look into the companies with this red frame, they are all connected to energy. So, number one, Royal Dutch, ExxonMobil, Sinopec, that's a Chinese oil company, BP British Petrol, PetroChina, United States, Total, France, Concord Philip, United States, again united states and you see most of them oil oil and there are some exceptions and the exception is for example volkswagen and toyota motors and general motors they are producing the stuff that eat all the oil so there is a trust of this oil and car companies in the world and the few, few companies that are not really involved in this business is Samsung with electronics and Walmart, a big store in China. So you see, they make the biggest turnover, they make the biggest value at um, stock, and they have sometimes only a few people in there because they are doing a lot of trade. And so you can guess that people who are working here have a very high income. If you work in a company like that here, yeah, it's um, in the same same size like this one, like Royal Dutch, you see they have about 20, no, 200 times as many people working. So if you work in a Walmart store, yes, you can have some income, but you never get rich. If you work in a company like that, you will see they have a big income. That is the reason you should think about working in the energy business. The next thing is why should we talk about energy? And why is this that energy is so relevant? And here is an interesting plot. That is from Gapminder. Gapminder was founded by Rosling, a Swedish scientist and a doctor. He thought why are some people rich why are some poor and what are the relations and so he has gone through all the data from the united nations and collected them and prepared them together with his team of course and so we have today access to all this information by that website you should go there and you should try on yourself to understand stuff like that i'll show you today the first thing is we can plot up the income per person. Income per person is a difficult number because what we actually calculate is the national cross product divided by the number of people. So it is not usually completely fair distributed. Some people are more rich, some people are a little bit poor. And so that is a first guess, but we don't have better numbers. And that is inflation adjusted. No, that's not really necessary for this plot, but if you let her run that plot. You can do that if you are in the online version. You can see um, numbers that are constant in dollars. And the next thing you should be aware of, that is a log scale. Log scale means between the ticks on our x axis, we have factors, not addition. So that means from here to here, we have a factor of 20,000, uh, of um, from 2,000 to 20,000, that means a factor of so it's 10 times more if you go from one major tick to one major tick. Um, 
The same is true for the epsilon axis. That's also a log scale. So, but here be aware, 200, 2000, 20,000. So this scale is about 100 times. That is a lot of change. And now, if we look into the lower part here, that are countries with very poor people. Most of them are in Africa. And you see they have a low income, less than $2,000 a year. That means less than $5 a day. And they have just no electricity use, 200 kilowatt hours a year. Maybe if they have a mobile phone or an air ventilation, but not more. And now we come to the next big, big country, that is India. It's developing, it's developing very rapid, and the income is quite better. People have maybe around $10 a day, a little bit less, eight. And we have already a higher use of electricity, two times higher, 400. Next state is China, the gigantic country with 1.6 billion people. The size of this bubble is the number of people. So look into the big bubbles. They are the most relevant for small countries. We don't care at the moment. China has a very high electricity demand. The reason is not because people are using too much electricity at home. They have a big production. You know, China may be the workbench of the world. and if you look into the products you have at home, you find China, made in China, and so on. Russia, another country, high energy use, not so much higher in reward. And I will try to paint here a line. Let's try that. So if we paint a line from here up to the top, you see some countries are above, far above that line. And that means these countries have high energy use, but not very efficient. The outcome is not that productive. Germany is a different case. Germany has a high income and it is below that line. That means Germany is a country saving energy whenever it can. You know this shutting down lights and all that. Here, we have the United States, that is the country with the highest income and the country with the highest demand on electricity. This gives us a first feeling that electricity seems to be a very relevant factor for developing countries. And so in the future, we will see more and more countries going the path from here to this top. And thereby getting richer and richer and using more and more electricity per person. This is another plot that is showing us the demand and the consumption of energy over time, that is over the last 50 years. And there is one big player in the world for energy, and that is oil. Most of the energy is oil based. The reason is cars and trucks and airplanes and all that stuff. They're all driven by air, by oil. There is here a time when the demand for oil was going a little bit down that was the so-called oil crisis where oil price was exploding and so the demand has gone down but over the years the demand is constantly rising you see that more or less a straight line the second most used energy source at the moment is coal in the 80s 90s the people thought oil uh, coal would go down and it should go down because it you produce a lot of carbon dioxide and carbon problem, you know, global warming. Um, and coal is the worst of the three here in our life. 
But then came China in in some other developing countries and they use a lot of coal for producing electricity. The third in this carbon-based energy sources is gas. Gas is very widely used because it's very cheap. We have the shell gas, we have new technologies that allow us to produce a lot of gas and we have pipelines from with a far, far distance, for example, from Russia to Western Europe and to Germany, that produce the gas far away from the place of usage, but they can transport it very cheap. Produce um, transporting gas is the cheapest of all of them, if you have a pipeline, of course. Um, there are two sources that we should mention. The one is nuclear power, the red line, and you see the Nuclear power is steady level. In the moment, we don't have a buildup of new nuclear power plants. How is the future? I don't know. We go in another lecture into that topic. And here we have for renewables. In the first time, it was more or less hydro. So, hydro energy is a renewable source, but uh, the Places where you can put hydro is difficult because in dense populated areas you don't have enough rivers and we don't have enough rivers at all to do that, all the hydro. So then production of this changed here and a new type of energy is coming in that is, for one thing, is solar and there is wind. We have now in our world a more or less significant part in wind and solar. It's a little bit more than double the production of nuclear power stations, but it's still far away from the mainstream of this power production. So it's a long way to stop all that, to convert that to these other carbon free sources. Why and how do we use this energy? And what are the main players over a long term? And here this uh, graph is a little bit similar to the first one, but now we add up all these energy sources so we get a little bit different idea what was going on. And so the first big machine that really used a lot of energy was the steam engine. It was invented in the 19th, it was more or less in the market in the 19th century. It was invented in the 18th century, but it was not significant as you see the line is very, very small. And um, all these steam engines were driven by coal. So till here we have only coal. Then after the, second, the First World War, oil came in, the red line, and substituted in some way the coal. Here we see that we have now more oil in use than coal. And then the times changed again. But now other energy sources came in, gas, and we already know hydropower and nuclear power and renewables. You don't see the renewables here because this slide is only going to 2008 and that point in time, the amount of renewables was quite small. The demand for energy is coming from electric motors, from cars, from commercial aviation, and today a not so small part is used by computer technology. For example, the huge Computer centers of Google eat up a lot of energy, and if you watch that, you will also use a computer, and I use a computer to do that lecture. This is the distribution of the energy by sectors. Who is demanding for energy? And most people are used to energy use at home. So, because here we feel 
the energy used directly if we switch on the computer, if we switch on the water, boiler, the electric furnace, there's different types we have at home, washing machines, and so on. This is only 27% of the whole energy use. That should be really mentioned. So if you save energy at home, then you will see that it doesn't matter too much. The next area where we know that we use a lot of energy is in traffic. Um, traffic is um, compounded into cars and personal transportation, buses and railways and airplanes. And the same is also true for some transportation of goods. And altogether, that is the second biggest part here, 28%. Then we have industry producing steel. We go into detail why that needs so much energy. And then all the other things that are done around um, business, small business, and trading, and so on, needs another 15%. If you look at home, what eats up your energy or more or less your electricity and why you do have to pay your bill? So the washing machine, the dishwasher and light and um, the oven, um, washing machine for clothes, a TV, a refrigerator and some energy that isn't used at all, it's standby. So a lot of things at home are running, but not really producing something, only some heat. Maybe that is 16%. I'm not quite sure that's true for every household, but this um, um, website, it's Stromsparer, it's saving electricity. This guy's, of course, they estimate that big bunch of electricity. So, Shut down your computer, shut down your um, audio and video, and so shut down your standby. You can stop half of your energy use. I'm not quite sure if that really works out. <clears throat> now, have a, a wide view to that topic, and we can now try to understand what mankind really needs. And so actually we don't eat electricity. We don't eat oil or stuff like that. We can live without all that types of energy. We could live thousands of years ago. But today we are in a different society and we need stuff for living, for example, in a northern area. And so one thing we need, for example, is thermal comfort. You want to have your room temperature in a small range, about maybe between 18 and 25 degrees, depends on your personal needs. But outside, the world is usually not in that temperature region. It may be cold in wintertime. Here in Germany, it can get white cold in the black forest and so you have to heat. If you are in a southern area in India or in China or in the United States, you have outside temperature beyond the 25, 40 degrees Celsius and you want to cool your room. And the same comes in, you need energy. And if you do that on a global scale, you need an amount of energy or first of all you need an amount of cubic meters with a changed temperature so that is a typical idea of a physicist you don't count exactly the amount of energy you use you first ask what is your demand 10 by the power 15 cubic meters of air should change the temperature about some degree so look into this classroom Usually we are in a classroom with maybe 
um, oh, if you look into your own room, maybe it says 50 cubic meter of space and you want to change the temperature about 10 degrees from maybe five, say 10 degree outside to 20 degree inside, then we make a small calculation back of the envelope to understand that. So we have in our room 50 meters cubic meter volume and we want to change the temperature from um, 10 up to 20 degrees so that is 20 kelvin difference and so we need for this change if you know the energy capacity you can do that in um, energy but we do the demand the terminal comfort demand is 1000 cubic meter kelvin that is the demand to keep your room in a best comfortable way so if you have a small room of course this number is smaller and if it is cold outside this number gets up but you can do that calculation and so you can do that multiplied by all the people on the world and all the people on the world we have about eight billion that means eight ten to the power nine so that is roughly 10 to the power 10 and this is roughly 10 to the power 3 so um what happens here is now we can collect that and we come to 10 to the power um 13 and we're still not here why yeah because you have to heat your room every day and so you at least 100 days in the year you have to heat or cool your room and if you multiply that by another 100 you end up at this number 10 to the power 15 and that is exactly the number we see here so that is an example how to do some calculations like that the next calculation here is for food if you like to eat food and you have to eat food otherwise you don't survive and you multiply that with all the people and all the year that is for 2005 and we end up with 10 to the power 18. do this calculation for your person how many joules of energy do you eat look on your muesli and your milk how much is the energy contained in there and multiply that by the number of people in the world and you end up with a number like that over the year we have to eat every day so 365 not only 100 like in my very simple guess on the left this is 18 percent of our energy by the way if you are a sportsman and you are doing cycling and you don't drive a car you need to eat more stuff that is not really a zero-sum game cycling and walking also needs some energy so the next thing that our civilization needs is structural material so that is all the stuff around our room is built from concrete and steel and our car is built by steel and a bridge and towers and all 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 the things around so the all of these materials have a tensile strength and you can multiply that by the volume that is a very abstract number i am true but if you do that you end up with all the material you have to use to keep our civilization running it's hard to do the calculation on a of an envelope here but i think the guys here did it exactly easier to calculate is freight transport how many tons of material do you want to transport so if you bring all of the stuff you have from china to germany that's a 10,000 kilometer journey and you do that 
with uh, one kilogram of material or with one ton of material, you have 10,000. If you do that for all people and all material, you end up with 10 to the power 12. That's an awful number. Then the passenger transport. You came here to Germany. That was quite an interesting travel. Maybe it is a thousand or two thousand kilometers and you travel back and forth. And if you do the calculation of all people in the world, you end here. And now there are some points usually not aware, not so aware, but for example, if you want to have a shower, and we again we have to heat water. In this moment it was air, now we heat water to some degree. And um, yes, we need some more stuff for that. And that is calculated here. Communication. Still a small fraction, only 6%, but it is not so small. So if you watch this video, you have energy for your laptop and we have energy for the internet, the routers and the servers and so on. Ending up transporting or managing 10 to the power 18 bytes. Oh, is that an extra byte? Yes, it seems so. And you have illumination. You need amount of light seconds. So only a flashlight a second, but if you go all over the year and all the people and all the places to work where you need light, it's another four percent. That's a small number. The reason is today we have very efficient light sources. You have LEDs and so that does don't care too much. So the big bunches are here. That is thermal comfort, heating, food structural material, transportation of persons, stuff. Now we look into the energy system from the primary source to the energy services. The point is that we have energy sources that are not well suited for our demand and so we have to convert to the different types during a chain from the extraction and treatment Extraction and treatment means typically we extract oil and gas from the well and other energy sources like sun. Sun is one of the absolutely biggest energy sources. It is the biggest energy source. We have it to convert it to a useful type of energy. So we have this six types of energy here. These are the main types, gas, coal, sun, uranium, oil, and farm and forest, often called as a biomass. So this energy is then converted into primary energy and it is extracted. So you sometimes hear about how many oil is used every day, that is the amount of extracted oil. Then we need conversion technologies because oil itself or coal is not very useful. No one wants to heat his room with coal and so we have different types of conversion technologies. One of the main types is the power plant. The power plant um, has an input, usually coal or also, of course, uranium, if it's a nuclear power station. Or for sun, then we use photovoltaic cells. That is another type of power plant. Um, what's not mentioned here is wind energy. Wind has wind converters. So after this first conversion process, we have secondary energy. And mainly we convert it to electricity, as you see. But there are exceptions. The one is, uh, for example, kerosene. We convert the oil in a refinery into kerosene, a part of it at least, to use it in cars and in aircrafts. Another thing is gas usually doesn't need much treatment. This is methane. It's more or less coming out from the well in this uh, uh, 
gasoline form, gas form and it has a little bit to be cleaned because there's water and other uh, types of gas in there but that's not a big issue. You may know that there is a butan and propan gas you can use at your campsite. Um, there are special fractions of the gas. Then we have to distribute this because at the place where we um, find the gas, for example in northern Russia, Russia or in uh, oil in Alaska or in the Middle East, it is not always a place where you want to use the energy. Or also the power plant, maybe the um, uh, nuclear power plant is not exactly nearby your home, so you have to transport that. For gas, we have a gas grid that is um, a set of pipes, big pipes. Um, by the way, these pipes store also a lot of energy because you have high pressure in there and the pipes are really long, thousands of kilometers, and so they store an amazingly huge amount of energy. But the gas grid is going then in smaller and smaller pipes till to your home and then you can use it exactly at the place your furnace at home. Electrical grid, the same situation. We have a high voltage grid and a medium voltage and low voltage and at, finally it ends at your socket in your room. You may have to convert it a little bit on your own by a transformer to charge your phone. Oil is sometimes transported by pipelines, sometimes by uh, large ships, uh, oil tankers, and uh, by trucks to the gas station. The, um, then you have the final energy you actually want to use. Gas at home or electricity at home, kerosene at the airplane and ethanol for example if you are starting with biomass. This is now, this type of energy is now converted into a useful energy. So, example at home, you have to burn the gas in a furnace and this is resulting in heat. And this heat is used for something, for an energy service, for example cooking. You use the heat to cook something. That is the final reason why you want to have the energy. You are not interested in this process at all. And now look into this electricity. Electricity is um, a service you can use very widely and you can use it for heating. That is not the most interesting way for computers, of course, light bulbs, air condition, and an awful lot of other applications. About 60% of the energy of electricity is ending up in a motor, for example, in an air conditioner to um, move something around or in a company where you have robots and all other things to transport stuff. What we are interested at home are things like cooking, information processing, illumination, thermal comfort, or we want to use the energy for passenger kilometers. We are actually not interested what type we use, but finally we can only use kerosene for the moment, other technologies are not available for the moment, or in mobility we are talking about ton kilometers. So all this together is done to satisfy human needs. As you have seen we have a long conversion process and during every conversion process with a long chain you can imagine that there is some waste. That means we actually don't use the whole amount of energy, the primary energy, we only can use a part of it. That is a sad thing, but it is a physical, a physical law defined thing. So uh, there is the Carnot process and that tells us that if you want to convert heat, for example, into electricity, you never will have 100% efficiency. Let's start with the primary energy. The primary energy, this number 496 exajoule, is the whole energy on this globe we use for our civilization. 
Some of the energy is directly used, for example, uh, heating a room when we don't have too much lose, loss. But if you convert a part of it into electricity, then we lose directly at the conversion process in the power station uh, 144 exajoules. Some of this um, energy can be catched by using the heat that is going into the air or into a river or into the ocean, depending on the type and place of the power station. But most of the time it is actually really wasted because there is no demand for this low temperature heat. Usually it is only about 60 degrees Celsius or something like that. Then you have a secondary energy. That is the energy now we can start to transport to our place of demand. This distribution has also some waste, um, for example, in the power lines. There is also a little bit of heat production. That is not that bad in electricity. You usually lose only 5 to 10 percent. It depends a little bit on distance. It depends on the type of transformers and so on. But finally, that's not too bad. And then you have the final energy and uh, arriving at your home and you convert it. And then not all the energy is a really useful service. For example, if you break your car, some of the energy is going into heat in your uh, brakes. Or if you illuminate your room, some of the light is not going really to your sheet of paper where you want to use it. Some energy is always not used. It's hard to exactly define what is really useful, but Finally, you see from the 500 exajoules, we have only a third really used in our services and we are interested in the services. Technically, it is not possible to optimize that to 100%. But one word about efficiency. If you start, for example, with crude oil, you are definitely interested that this um, valuable crude oil is not wasted during the process. Um, and if you want to have passenger kilometers at the end, you are interested that this oil is most efficiently, as efficient as possible, converted into passenger kilometers, for example, using very energy efficient airplanes. The other thing is if you use, for example, sun energy, then you have a different situation because sun is overcrowded. You have an overload of sun energy. We have about 10,000 times more sun energy than we ever can use. So it isn't a big difference if you have a 20% efficiency photovoltaic cell or 22 or maybe only 15% because sun is enough here. And the point that is critical here is the price and not the efficiency as long as the primary source is in large amounts there. Oil is limited, coal is also limited, and they have near the limitation also the problem that they produce carbon and carbon dioxide, and uh, that is a greenhouse gas, and we don't want to have that. So we also have to be careful not to use too much of this um, raw materials. Now we can look into the different areas and the change of the services for energy. <clears throat> we start 50 years ago, 1971, and in this year we had a global use of energy in the range of 170 exajoule in the whole world. And this was distributed, or it's still more or less distributed, into residential use. That's the thing you use at home. And in industrial use, that is blue in markation. And a lot of things is going into transportation. You see two areas um, have grown a little bit more than the other ones. That is the residential use. Today we have a lot of residential use because air condition is widely 
used today even in poor countries and the transportation is also exploded because we have an international trade we have a lot of airplanes air traffic is growing about three percent every year and we have raw material production raw material production isn't that bad the reason is the industry learned to be more energy efficient and the demand is not that exploding but there is still it is still the biggest part of the cake here if you look into the industrial use of energy we go in different types of this energy use in more detail to understand where all this energy goes in this exactly now look down there there's a small line this is agriculture forestry and fishery all that together they use only up a very very small amount of our energy but be aware some of the chemicals are going into this and maybe they are calculated a little bit different because um, you have not the primary energy used in the agriculture but you use stuff from other industrial sources as i already mentioned there is a long trend to use more energy and the interesting thing is there's one type of energy that is very useful and so it is the electricity and the electricity demand is growing exponentially exponentially means that you have every year an addition in this case for example of three percent and in the next year you already start at a higher level and so this curve is going around and steeper and steeper upwards that means exponential and be always careful if something's exponential it doubles after some time so in our electricity here we have the red dots and the red dots show the global electricity production the data are from british brett hall they have a very good database i mentioned that at the beginning and you see they match very good with this blue line that is for regression calculation for these points but you see there are some small deviations for example here in 2008 the point is a little bit lower what happened in 2008 uh, you might know there was a financial crisis and so the industry didn't produce as much as it usually does and yes planes were not used that much and so on so you have a small reduction in electricity production okay airplanes don't matter here and if we wait 25 years from 1990 to 2015 we see that the amount of energy that is used has grown from about 12 um, petawatt hours or 12,000 terawatt hours to 24 um, petawatt hours or 24,000 terawatt hours and so that was doubling and if we wait for another 25 years we are roughly in the range of 50 and so we have another double there is also a big discussion if it really will double within the next 25 years i'm convinced that this will happen because there are more people getting richer and as you have seen if people get more and more rich they use more and more energy the number of people won't double in this period but the standard of living will grow and more and more processes are going to be electric so look into electric cars um, today we have only a few electric cars but more and more are coming in because electricity can be used much more efficient and electricity if it comes from the sun is a very clean way to produce energy now we have talked about words like energy power electricity and heat and actually i didn't define that in detail 
and now we have to understand a little bit more what we really mean if we use the word energy. So energy is defined by the potential to do work. Now what's working actually? If you take your body and sit on a bicycle and ride up the hill, then you have to work hard to reach the hill top. That is work. And what you are doing is you are lifting stuff. You are lifting stuff against the gravitational force. And lifting stuff is one of the typically primary ways to do potential work. That is interesting because you can release this energy again. If you race then downhill, you don't have to pedal and the bicycle is running on its own. But usually lifting stuff needs energy and in rare cases you can regenerate the energy in your bicycle. You won't get the energy back. <laughs> you have to eat anyway at the end of your bicycle tour. If you are in a car, that situation will be different. We will see that in detail. That is one thing. The second thing is, and that is different to the lifting stuff story, that is moving itself. Now, moving itself, if you look in physics, you see there is no energy involved. So, for example, um, a planet like the Earth is circling around the Sun, don't eating up any energy. But that works only in space because there is no air and it's vacuum and so it can move without any friction. If you are on our planet and you want to drive with your car, you will see that your car stops after some time. The reason is there is air friction and if you want to ride fast, you need more and more energy. Um, uh, it is then eating up the energy only to have pass the friction of the air. The same is true for planes. Planes are a little bit more complex because you have to need some energy that it is not falling down at all. Ships um, have friction against the water, not that much on airplanes. So ships are usually a very efficient way to transport stuff. So you see the very big container ships and they have a really a small imprint in energy use. Air, moving air itself, for example, in an air conditioner needs energy or a ventilator, you have to put energy there. The same true with water. If you want to open your water files and you see the water is coming out during the transmission to, uh, through a pipe, you need energy. And for many materials, you have also to use energy if you want to move them. So this is the second big um, uh, physical reason we need energy. The next one is the chemical change. So if you look around on the globe, a lot of stuff we want to have is not really available. For example, aluminium, you have to convert that from the raw material, from brauxit in this case. And this needs electric energy. And this electric energy is coming, of course, from the power station and so you are forced to use this energy to generate usable materials like aluminium, chloride, all the plastic stuff and so on are involving chemical change processes. Well known is a change of temperature. If your room is cold, you have to heat it or if it's too hot, you have to air condition that room. So where do we use this change in temperature? in rooms, in cooking, uh, but also in production. For example, steel, you have to melt the steel for transforming it into other useful stuff. And finally, there's one new type of energy consumption in the last 50 years, and that's computation. Computation, uh, the question is, how much energy do you need for computation? Well, what, what's the reason that you need energy in there? It is a little bit more tricky if you go really into the fundamentals of that question because you can show that computation itself doesn't need energy at all, but we haven't the technology available to do that without energy. We have to use our microchips and they consume a lot and they have a 
high energy density by the way, for example, a microchip may have eat up up to a hundred watts or yeah, 0 0.1 kilowatt hours are in an hour. So this is the energy and now we come to another word that is called power. And the power is energy conversion per time. So I want to give you a small uh, formula for that. So power is the energy um, divided by time. So, and if we convert that again, then we have the energy is nothing else than power multiplied by time. So this is sometimes confusing um, and I want a little bit to insist in that. So time is well known. You usually count it in seconds or in hours. That's the first trouble we have. And power you usually use the word watt. So um, if you have now a watt second, one watt and one second, this gives you the unit joule. It's named after an English scientist who detected that energy is always the same, even if you have heat or uh, mechanical energy. That was found by joule. So we call it joule or the abbreviation is a G. Now, if you have this unit that is a very small unit, you can move uh, to, to remember that um, um, chocolate uh, one meter high, then you use one joule. But the energy in the chocolate is much higher. And the energy we usually have today is not usually counted in joules. You usually uh, wait for one hour and use um, a watt for an hour. Then you have a watt hour. Um, that is much more. And if you, it's uh, it's about 3,600, it's, it's 3,600 joules. Um, so by 3,600, yes, of course, that's the number of seconds in, a, in an hour. So you have 3,600 joule. And now if we go beyond that, we can have a kilowatt hour. And a kilowatt hour is nothing else than a thousand times this watt and you end up with 3,600, no, 3.6 um, million joules. So a kilowatt hour is a lot of energy. Um, so here, yeah. imagine that. So there is a conversion factor, of course. You can convert joules into kilowatt hours or whatever you need. But that is a little bit tricky if you are not used to, but you have to get used to these words and these units in our energy word. Now look a little bit more into these units. The units for energy are a real disaster. The reason is there are so many ways to describe energy and power that that are traditional ways. For example, people used coal and so they ask it only how many tons of coal do you use? Or the people trade with oil and they ask how many barrels of oil do you use? A barrel of oil is a um, 150 nine liters of oil and so there is only one way to do that in an exactly scientific way and so there's the system international and the system international have units and there are the well-known units like a meter and a second but there are also these units like a joule and, and here we have we should know mention that there is a newton the force and so these units, you should know from physics, 
and if you don't know them please um, read a little bit about that so energy we as already mentioned we have a joule and remind one gram 100 gram of stuff yes your chocolate plate um, moving one meter high is one joule so the power is in counted in watts and it is one joule every second as already mentioned now if you want to go into these factors i have a, a website um, volker questioning is a scientist at the, uh, in, in berlin and he has a nice website where he collects a lot of information about energy and renewable energy by the way here we look now in the big numbers and you have already learned there's this joule and now you can have an extra joule so an extra joule is a very big number so to remember you have a kilo and this uh, if you have a thousand kilo you have a mega so 3.6 mega joules is one kilowatt hour no i want to erase that it's not a good place to put it here um, so if you have more then you have the giga you are now used to these numbers a little bit more because the computer scientists you have a kilobyte a megabyte a gigabyte but you can have also a kilowatt a megajoule or a gigajoule and after giga you have a tera that is a thousand times the giga and after tera you have a peta it's a thousand times a terra and if you have a peta you have an exa at the next level so to remind you this is um, 10 to the power now let's think kilo was a thousand a million and that is has nine zeros nine exponent nine here it's the exponent another thousand it's 12 and another thousand is 15 because you have to add three numbers and if you have an extra you have another thousand and then you have an 18 so 10 to the power 18 is an extra and the extra joule is is formally the best unit for that and this um, slide gives you some ideas what an extra tool does so we start down there there is a tool that is one tool that was with one newton meters then we have one kilo tool and nearby there is the so-called british terminal unit the british um, is an old industrial country and they defined a british terminal unit I don't go in the reason why they do that but they do that and it is a 1055 um, joules now let's erase that here that is not too nice we go to this so sometimes you will find this unit if we go further up we come to the kilowatt hour now kilowatt hour is somewhere in between a regular or not so regular uh, unit but I prefer the kilowatt hour in our discussion of energy because a kilowatt hour is the amount of energy you usually pay for at the electricity bill so you have electricity bill and in Germany you pay about yes how expensive is a kilowatt hour um, it depends on a lot of stuff but it's zero point three euro in germany other countries mm, usually cheap or cheaper in swiss you pay only 0 0.1 euro um, per kilowatt hour in your electricity bill so that gives you an imagine how the value of energy is and that is by the way of course 3.6 megawatt hours uh, mega joules 3.6 mega joules so this is a point you really should remember because that happens often so then you have a barrel of oil a barrel of oil contains 
5.7 gigajoule yeah remember the nine here um you can have an oil a ton of oil that's not so widely used but because you see 29 and this is factor of this 150 liters of oil they give you a little bit more energy and you have a ton of oil equivalent that is the energy you can actually use that is a is a it's always tricky to uh, sorry this was the coal and that was the oil um the oil is widely used and has a higher energy density than the coal so you see there are small if you compare that with the full scale here small differences but of course it's a difference if you have a ton of oil it gives you about uh, 12 gigajoules more than a ton of coal it's relevant if you burn that for example in an airplane <laughs> coal burned airplanes are not used at all so now we can go to a huge amount of energy that is a million tons of oil and then you come into this petter joules and you can have another strange unit a quad is a british terminal unit it's about one extra joule and you can have another unit that is sometimes used that's a terawatt year so if you have a terawatt and that over one year then we are range in the range of the global demand and now we look at the right part here you see a city like new york or singapore uses about one exajoule in a year and if you look into the whole world we have seen another slide with um, 496 but it is, doesn't make sense to be precise in this number at all um, for 500 extra joule is the global primary energy of this globe from our civilization and if you look into the energy that the sun spends to us then here look that's the hour and one hour sun on our globe is just the amount of energy you use for the whole industry of this globe and the whole mankind that is amazing that shows us that the sun is about 10,000 times more energy than we use but be careful that's not easy to convert into useful energy so this is you have to learn that of course no never do that but it's always good to know where to look at and so i give you this slide this guy here did all these units in one big table and we can have a look you have a mega tool that's all the things we know and now you can go down in different units like british terminal unit ton of energy uh, kilowatt hour year that we talked about and here's one interesting unit this is the kilocalorie if you look on the label of your food you sometimes find kilocalorie or if you are trying to reduce the diet or so you may count kilocalories what's that unit this unit is coming from an old uh, french technology where we ask how much energy do you need to heat water uh, about one degree and then you end up with kilocalories so first with calories and then thousands of them are kilocalories and most of the calories you count are kilocalories by the way so terajoules um, gigacalories okay million tons of energy and a million british units and so on so and here's the gigawatt year again that's the energy typically um, nuclear power stations generates during one year so you can look up at that table if you need 